Bowl of Chicago. You're watching Channel 11, WTTW. This is the Nightly Business Report, made possible by the Digital Equipment Corporation with its VAX family of network computing systems connecting the front office, the factory floor, the engineering center, and the MIS department. Digital has it now. By Business Week magazine. Providing timely business information to over six million decision makers every week. Business Week, America's business news weekly. And by Kidder Peabody. For over 120 years, one of the world's leading investment firms serving the financial needs of individuals, corporations, and governments. Kidder Peabody, professionalism worldwide. And public television stations across the nation. Good evening, everyone. Well, now it's not only OPEC that's talking about propping up oil prices. In Houston, at the American Petroleum Institute's annual meeting, Trade group head George Keller today called for the establishment of a minimum price floor for domestic crude oil as what he called disaster insurance for the U.S. oil industry. Keller, who did not suggest what that minimum price should be, said a price floor for oil would enable domestic oil companies to keep going until world oil prices stabilize at higher levels. Keller warned that if oil prices stay in their current range, the result will be further devastation in the oil patch. If oil prices stay at $15 a barrel, for an extended period, the API estimates that U.S. domestic oil production could decline by two or three million barrels a day by 1991, and domestic consumption could increase by a similar amount over the same period of time. These trends, declining domestic production combined with increasing consumption and a higher level of imports, have put our nation on a collision course with another energy crisis. Now, Keller, who is also the chairman of Chevron, said setting a minimum survival price level for oil would probably have no significant impact on consumers. He noted that each dollar a barrel increase in oil prices translates into a 2.3 cent a gallon rise at the gasoline pump. Linda? And on Capitol Hill, the talk was also of raising domestic oil prices. The incoming chairman of the Senate Energy Committee, Senator Bennett Johnson of Louisiana, said the best way to do that would be through an oil import fee. I think if you want to keep a domestic energy industry, you've got to have an oil import fee. I think you ought to keep a domestic uh, energy industry. I think it's vital for the country's future. And I think it is uh, probably a less painful tax than others. Whether it is politically possible depends upon a lot of things, including the cooperation of the president. Meanwhile, the domestic oil producers could be getting some help from OPEC in bringing oil prices up. Kuwait's oil minister today announced that the cartel's price fixing committee will meet on Friday in Ecuador to discuss ways to raise oil prices to $18 a barrel. Paul? Thanks partly to renewed buying interest in IBM and a few other blue chips, the Dow Industrial Average overcame early weakness yesterday to close with a gain of five and three quarter points. And that rally carried over in today's opening as the Dow moved up almost another four points by 10 a.m. The problem was, however, trading volume was very unimpressive because most banks, the Federal Reserve, and the government bond markets were all closed for Veterans Day. So the Dow's gain was trimmed to just a point or so for the next four hours. The Dow Transport Index acted as a drag, too, with as much as a nine-and-a-half point loss after Continental Air stirred up fears of a new airfare war by announcing it would soon have some cut-rate prices. Persistent strength in the oils, for reasons you just heard, helped the blue-chip sector improve in the last hour of the session, and the Dow Industrial Average went on to close with a modest gain of 3.66 at 1895.95. Theoretical high of the day almost to 1905, the low down around 1882. Trading volume today down almost 2 million shares from yesterday's pace, rather quiet. Up volume exceeded down volume, however, by nearly 20 million shares. Dow Transports reflecting very weak airline group off exactly 8 points. Utilities up 0.17, a little over a 1-point loss in the Dow 65. The closing tick a modestly strong, plus 230. Standard & Poor's 500 gained nearly a point, almost a point and a half gain in the 400. The 100 up 0.83. The SPOC 250 gained 0.95. New York Stock Exchange Index rising nearly a half point, NASDAQ up one and a third points, Value Line gained 0.41, and the Wilshire 5,000 up nearly seven and one quarter points. 
Well, with the Federal Reserve and most banks closed for Veterans Day, there was, for all practical purposes, no meaningful bond trading, and what there was showed little price movement. Uh, of course, the uh, Treasuries were not traded at all today. The GMAC corporates were off an eighth at 99 and 3 eighths. The bond index losing 0.02. Some municipal trading with a quarter point gain to 97 and a half bit in the Jacksonville uh, municipals. And finally, of course, with the Federal Reserve closed, no Fed funds at all. I'll be back shortly to show you where the action was in today's stock market. On the precious metals markets today, both gold and silver rose, but platinum lost more than $10 to finish at $541.20 the ounce. The New York currency markets were closed today in observance of the Veterans Day holiday. And on the New York Mercantile Exchange, oil prices inched upward, with West Texas Intermediate closing up four cents at $15.38 a barrel. In London, North Sea Brent crude finished unchanged from yesterday's close. The trade gap between the U.S. and Japan continued to widen last month as Japan posted a record merchandise trade surplus with the United States of just under $5 billion. The dollar value of Japanese imports of American-made goods rose 6% in October, but the value of Japanese exports to the U.S., led by shipments of auto parts and office machinery, jumped 24%. However, on a volume basis, Japan's total exports fell 1.2% last month, while its imports registered their sixth straight monthly gain, up 17%. In the last few years, Democrats have generally taken a harder line on trade issues than the Republicans. And now that the Democrats have regained control of the Senate, Washington correspondent Bob Friedman reports that it may be a whole new ball game for legislation to restrict imports. When voters swung the balance of power in the Senate last week to the Democrats, they also moved trade to the top of the Senate agenda. Democrats want to make trade a key issue in 1988. While the White House has been pressuring Senate Republicans to downplay the issue. Already Texas Senator Lloyd Benson, who will probably chair the Finance Committee, is expected to be tough on trade. But Trade Representative Clayton Yeider does not think Democrats will return with a protectionist mandate. But, uh, I would hope uh, it will not have a, uh, a protectionist ring. Uh, there certainly was nothing in the, in the uh, election last Tuesday that would uh, support protectionism. A House trade bill passed earlier this year was labeled protectionist by the White House. Senate Democrats look for a trade bill not quite as harsh. The emphasis in the new Congress will be to try to get fair rules in the world trading system. The trade bill we passed should include authorization for a new round of multilateral trade negotiation, changes in trade law to allow domestic industries to obtain relief from unfair trade policies. This is important for domestic industries and also to bring foreign nations to the negotiating table. We need to address the issues of intellectual property rights, non-market economy dumping, service industries trade. And many industry and government groups are focusing on competitiveness through quality, productivity, and price. For instance, the textile industry is stressing its ability to make quick delivery to retailers, but it's also looking for help from Capitol Hill. What we really need is a system that will slow down import growth by uh, mandating quotas. Much of the textile industry's competition comes from Japan and the Pacific Basin country. There's now some talk here of Japan bashing to reduce that nation's record trade surplus for the U.S. There is also talk here that the administration will take a tougher stand on trade. They should provide a package, even if it's a minimalist package, because they will then be in the fray. If they don't provide a, their own trade legislative package, it's my concern that the administration will not be a major actor in the debate that takes place in the Hill. And many House members would like another chance to debate on trade and tone down the bill passed earlier this year. Observers say that bill was more of a political statement. And it looks like those House members will get their chance as trade legislation is almost assured early in the 100th Congress. In Washington, Bob Friedman for the Nightly Business Report. Well, the head of the agency that ensures bank deposits says U.S. financial institutions are in danger of being engulfed by a flood of public and private debt. Speaking to the U.S. League of Savings Institutions Convention in San Francisco, FDIC Chairman William Seidman warned that the heavy load of debt could turn a mild recession or normal business downturn into a severe recession. And he added that the current level of loan defaults could jeopardize the stability of our financial institutions. When it comes to getting financial services, the American public has plenty of choices, and for the past several years, the trend among providers of financial services has been to offer as many services as possible under one roof in what's been termed the financial supermarket. 
Has the financial supermarket proved itself, or was it just a passing fad? Leslie Nichol set out to find out in Chicago. The one-stop financial shop, a term given to companies that try to pull the full range of financial services all together under one corporate roof, has been gathering momentum for the last 10 years. Merrill Lynch introduced the CMA account. Recently, even automobile companies are bringing mortgage loans together with their auto loans. Perhaps the most ambitious of the one-stop shops today is Sears. The Chicago-based retailer houses Allstate Insurance Company, Caldwell Banker Real Estate, and the Dean Witter Brokerage House. And through Dean Witter, Sears last year initiated the Discover Card to compete with Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. We have built Allstate to be the second largest property casualty insurance company, which simply means that they are the second largest in providing homeowners insurance, providing automobile insurance, and we're a very big factor today in the life insurance business. So financial services is something that we're pretty comfortable with. I also think that the resources and background of Sears are unique, that the others don't have it. And to do it would be, would be very costly for these other companies. However, Merrill Lynch's recent decision to sell off its real estate operation has at least one banking expert saying that Sears and the other companies may be running into trouble. At Northwestern University, Stuart Greenbaum says the Merrill Lynch move is significant, think, that it suggests uh, while bringing together certain financial services is very successful, to try to bring them all together under one roof may not be so successful. I think that, that uh, one of the reasons that Merrill Lynch uh, chose to retreat from, from a very major investment initiative is that they may have discovered that those managerial methods that apply so well in other areas that they're engaged in may not apply so well in the area of real estate brokerage. Well, Greenbaum says the idea of financial supermarkets will ultimately grow and become more far-reaching, he is skeptical about the near future. That's because Greenbaum says so far no one has been able to show that giving out the widest range of retail financial services also means taking in the biggest profits. In Chicago, Leslie Nickel for the Nightly Business Report. There was no supermarket for stocks today. As we review the closing Dow, we see a gain of about three and two-thirds points, but advances and declines were just about in a standoff. 49 new highs for the year, 13 new lows. Topping the active list on three and three-quarter million shares, USX down one-eighth of a point. Then came Staley Continental up one and seven ace. Company couldn't explain the strength, but uh, abounding on the street are restructuring uh, rumors for Staley. Mobile and that firm oil group up three quarters. American Telephone edged up one quarter. ITT up one and an eighth. Bethlehem Steel, poor old Bessie, down a quarter at five and a quarter during the day. It traded as low as four and seven eighths. That's the lowest that stock has ever been since the founding of Bethlehem Steel in 1905. Even during the Great Depression, the low of the stock was seven. Unical up one and three quarters, rumors all over saying uh, that uh, possibly Standard Oil is going to make a buyout bid. Standard has been looking for a West Coast oil. Goodyear up a quarter today. Archer Daniels Midland gained one half. E.F. Hutton down five eighths. AMR, parent company of American Airlines, down one and seven eighths on the threat of a possible new air fare war. Holiday ends up two and three quarters. Rumors that Donald Trump, the New York developer, might be making a bid. J.C. Penney up two and five eighths. First quarter earnings for Penny up 25 percent. Southland Corp up two and a quarter. It was put on the special recommended list by the Oppenheimer brokerage. Standard Oil itself up one and three eighths. Yesterday it secured a five and a half billion dollar line of credit from its banks. Textron up four and an eighth. Take over talk there. Finally, United Airlines down two points in the weak air group. Timeplex rose one point. Company says it'll buy up to 500,000 of its own shares. Ponderosa rose two and a half. Standard & Poor's Market Scope says this company is the subject of takeover rumors. El Torito up one and an eighth. WR Grace is going to buy the 27% it doesn't already own for $20.50 a share. Walmart gained one and a quarter. The big retailer announced a 28% uh, gain in its third quarter earnings over last year. Allegheny Corp up eight and a quarter. It disclosed its restructuring plans today. Uh, that will include $41 in share uh, uh, in cash for each shareholder, plus one share of a new company called Allegheny Financial. That's supposed to be worth around 80 bucks. Emory Air Freight was down one and five eighths. The company has suspended its quarterly dividend of 12 and a half cents starting the first quarter of next year. On the American Exchange, a gain of just over a quarter point in the index, volume down about a million shares from yesterday's pace. Advances and declines, almost a standoff there. Wix companies on an active 1.4 million shares led the 
Active List down an eighth. Atari, which just went public at a uh, price of 12 and a half last Friday, up one and seven eighths, doing well. ICH, despite a 20% rise in third quarter earnings, lost one and a quarter. Don't change in Texas Air or Lorimar Telepictures. Lehigh Press up two and three quarters. The company's accepted a leverage buyout bid of $45 a share. Entertain and marketing up one and a half. No news from the company today, but the firm says their earnings are expected out next, next week and business has been good. NASDAQ trading, the index up one and a third points, trading volume down about three and a half million shares from yesterday's pace. About 11 stocks up for every nine down, the 100 index up 2.11. MCI Communications topped the active list with a quarter point gain. Genentech up one and a half. Henley Group gained three eighths. Crazy Eddie up one quarter after big loss yesterday. The company's founder sold some stock. Sun Microsystems off seven eighths. The company announced a four million share offering of new stock. Volt Information Sciences lost a quarter, pick and save gained a quarter, as did Service Master. Watts Industries A, no change, and Liebert lost one half. Systems Associates up three and seven eighths. The company's received a $13.25 cash buyout bid per share from American Express Travel. DeBrell Brothers up one and a half. The company plans to buy up to $10 million worth of its own stock. Chicago Pacific rose three points. The company is making a Dutch auction self-tender for up to a million and a half shares between $30 and $33 each. Media General up two and a half after announcing a two-for-one split, 10% boost in the cash dividend. But then Cleveland Cliffs lost the quarter. The company has suspended its five-cent quarterly dividend in order to conserve cash. My street critique guest tonight is Mr. James Dines, the editor of the well-known Dines Letter. A week ago, when the industrial average stood just about where it is tonight, Mr. Dines issued his first short-term sell signal on the market in just over a year. I asked him what prompted it, how severe a decline he expects, and how long it'll last. Uh, I switched out of the uh, market on June 15, 1982. I switched out of gold into the stock market at 796, uh, right at rock bottom. And I've been major bullish on the market pretty much all the way up here. Uh, there have been periodic uh, declines as we've gone along. I'm looking for another one of them right now. Uh, the market is up near its, right near its all-time highs. You're getting some internal deterioration and weakness. And I'm looking for a setback of around 10% uh, within the next few months. Okay, well, what kind of stocks would lead us back then when this uh, correction's over, Jim? I'm looking for some excitement on the uh, uh, over-the-counter and the American Stock Exchange. I think low-price speculatives are going to lead the way back. It's been three years since we've had any excitement there. I think we're overdue some, for, for, for a big rally in the speculative groups. As usually happens in the late stages of a bull market. Yeah, later on and maybe in the spring or summer of 87. All right, any suggestions, uh, specific issues you like uh, for a comeback when it comes? Uh, yes, there are two stocks I like. One is Westlake, Venture, uh, Westlake Resources, that's WLKV on the Vancouver Exchange. They'll probably earn $2 a share, and the stock sells it to, which is one times earnings. They're into lasers, and they also have a huge gold deposit. Uh, the second one is the Genentech put options, uh, which are the April 90s at 10 and a quarter. The symbol is GEQDR. You're a little negative on Genentech, I see. <laughs> yes. Uh, you spoke of gold in this Westlake Resources. You're, of course, known as the original gold bug. Uh, is it ready to buy yet, or do you, would you think it's going to go a lot lower? Well, I switched out of gold in, uh, in, uh, in 1982, and uh, because I foresaw a big deflation, we're already getting it now in agriculture and mining and energy and uh, commercial real estate and heavy industries such as steel. So I'm, I'm out of gold, but I'm watching it closely. Okay. Jim Dines, thanks very much for being with us. Sure. That's our Wall Street wrap-up. It's widely acknowledged that the nation's major cities have a glut of office space. But while many expect office construction to slow down and vacancy rates to drop once the tax reform law takes effect, a new study suggests that may not be the case. New York correspondent Neil Cavuto reports. They are the mammoth monuments to modern America. The only problem is many of this country's gleaming skyscrapers are going empty. That's right, empty. One out of four is vacant today throughout the United States. One out of every four buildings. We're walking down the street, one out of every four buildings is empty. David Birch is director of a program on regional change at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His study, in conjunction with Arthur Anderson and company, shows soaring national office vacancy rates from around 4% in 1970 to 14% last year and an estimated 20% by 1995. It's a little bit gloomy right now because we have such high national vacancy factors and they've been as high or higher now than I can ever recall in the last 15 years. And it's not one city, it's numerous cities. The problem as realtors like Charles Spaulding see it is tragically simple. Too much space for too few workers. For example, between 1975 and 1985, the demand for primary office space construction was about 900 million square feet. Yet the industry built 1.3 billion square feet. By 1995, the study shows that even the strong middle Atlantic states could have vacancy rates of 12.3%, double the so-called acceptable rate. 
the South Atlantic region will be worse, with a vacancy rate of 18.4%. In the East South Central states, 20.7%. In the Mountain states, 33.7%. And in the Pacific states, 27.6%. Needless to say, not very good news for commercial realtors. When you look at those kind of numbers and you talk to other people in the industry, do you all look at one another nervously and wonder, hey, are you going to be around or am I going to be around? Well, I think there's definitely going to be some cons consolidation. Then there's the new tax law, which does away with many real estate tax shelters, even though most experts say the industry discounted tax reform long ago. The tax law may get credit for causing a slowdown in construction, but the reality is the overbuilding is what will cause the slowdown in construction, not the tax law. When you look at where all of the money comes from, the large pension funds, insurance companies, uh, I don't think it's going to really impact them the way people are talking about. Now, it's important to point out that many of those vacancy rate projections for the next 10 years are built on developers slowing down their present building plans. If they don't, real estate experts say it is very likely that vacancy rates could be double the bleak levels they'll likely be 10 years from now. In New York, Neil Cavuto for the Nightly Business Report. TWA says it's reached tentative agreement on a new contract with its pilots union. The deal reportedly bars Chairman Carl Icahn from breaking up the airline this year while extending some concessions the pilots made in January until 1992. The proposed contract now goes to the 3,000 TWA pilots for a ratification vote. Coming up, A. Michael Lipper discusses the advantages of investing in stock-based mutual funds. As Paul noted, three major retailers came in with third quarter earnings reports today and they all reported strong profits gains. J.C. Penney says lower markdowns and strong store and catalog sales led it to post record third quarter earnings of $1.55 a share. The Limited says a 31% rise in its third quarter sales helped boost its earnings for the period to a record $0.36 cents a share. And helped by revenues from 39 new stores that opened during the quarter, Walmart stores experienced a 36% rise in its earnings. Sears Roebuck will soon have a new man in charge of its retail operations. The chain today named Michael Bozick as chairman and chief executive officer of its merchandising group, replacing William Bass, who is retiring at the end of the year. The 45-year-old Bozick joined Sears 23 years ago as a trainee and worked his way up the Sears corporate ladder until being named president of Sears Canada in 1984. Helicopter says it has turned down a bold request from the Iranian government to buy spare parts for the company's 214A military helicopters. Bell was a major supplier of military equipment to Iran during the 1970s, but the company says it abides by the Reagan administration's ban on military sales to the government of the Ayatollah Khomeini. Last month's cable to Bell helicopter is believed to represent Iran's first attempt to buy military hardware directly from an American company. In tonight's Money File segment, Lipper Analytical Services President A. Michael Lipper says now may be the right time for some investors to take a look at diversifying into equity funds. Heavy reliance on any single investment is a classic pitfall for individual investors. Diversification of assets usually produces optimum total return over a lifetime. Yet today, the largest portion of the almost $700 billion mutual fund industry is in one category, fixed income funds. Today, fixed income funds, including money market and tax exempt funds, are now over $500 billion. A surge in sales has now made long-term taxable fixed income funds larger than general equity funds. This is in the face of a strong but volatile stock market. Most individual investors may be unduly conservative with their holdings. Now may be a good time to consider shifting some of their money into equity funds. We fully acknowledge that the stock market is no longer undervalued. However, general equity funds offer the diversification of investments which modify the risk 
of equity investment. Therefore, fund investors who are exclusively or largely in fixed income funds could begin to dollar cost average their investments to a 25 to 50 percent commitment into equity funds. This is a particularly important time to make this shift. Inflation is now low, even though there are no significant curbs on money or debt creation by governments around the world. Low rates of inflation regretfully cannot last. The growth in fixed income securities markets worldwide is unprecedented and without major market dislocations caused by a financial breakdown of a major market participant. This also may not last. However, return on equity of public companies is con currently considerably higher than interest rates, which demonstrates that over time it is better to own assets than to loan assets. In summary, individual investors may want to review their holdings and to begin to shift into equities to achieve a better risk-reward ratio in their portfolios. I am Michael Lipper. Recapping tonight's top stories, the man who heads Chevron and the oil industry's leading trade group calls for a floor on domestic oil prices to keep the oil industry from going under. Wall Street doesn't seem to think the oil companies are about to go under as persistent strength in the energy sector helps the Dow Industrial Average to gain three and two-thirds points at 1895.95. Looking ahead to tomorrow, we'll go to Detroit to take a look at the latest trends in the robotics industry. And that's it for this edition of the Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, November 11th. For Linda, for Paul, and for all of us at the Nightly Business Report, good night. The Nightly Business Report is made possible by Kidder Peabody. Our over 120 years of investment experience is an arch to build upon, serving the financial needs of individuals, corporations, and governments. Kidder Peabody, professionalism worldwide. By Business Week magazine. Providing timely business information to over 6 million decision makers every week. Business Week, America's business news weekly. And by the Digital Equipment Corporation, with its VAX family of network computing systems connecting the front office, the factory floor, the engineering center, and the MIS department. Digital has it now. And public television stations across the nation. For a transcript of this program, please send $3 check or money order to NBR Transcripts, P.O. Box 12724, Overland Park, Kansas, 66212. Please include the date of the broadcast. <laughs>